This episode is brought to you in partnership with the NYU AD Arts Center. Now we have to be radical. And so can the limitation actually kind of fuel the avant-garde is a really exciting premise. As NYU AD Arts Center's 2019-2020 season came to a close, Bill Bragan, its executive art director, and his team began thinking about the next season. They were fully aware of the economic impact the pandemic had on artists around the world. There was the uncertainty of whether there would be in-person performances, as well as the potential of working with a new enforced online medium. This led to discussions with artists. Michael Silverstone and Abby Browdy from 600 Highwaymen, a theater-making duo based in New York whose work often explores human connections and intimacy, brought the first part of 1,000 Ways to NYU AD. The work would be a departure from their previous pieces. Actually, we had started working on 1,000 Ways several years ago, and we were imagining this piece that would take place over three distinct installations, and this first one being on the telephone. I mean, I think Bill is very adventuresome, and what's wonderful about partnering with him and with NYU AD is that he has a deep understanding of the inquiry of an artistic process that we're not just going to be able to talk about the finished product, that it is about the experience of something and what it might do and what it might feel like rather than the end result. And he's very courageous in that way as an artistic director and very willing to sort of engage with those questions, which has been wonderful. With lockdowns in place across the world, the artists had to come up with new ways to explore the themes that inform their art. Abby and Michael reflect on how this rendition of 1,000 Ways differed from their previous works. The biggest difference is that this is a piece that's only audible. There's no visual element to the piece besides what you experience in your home. So it's the first time we're working in a way that doesn't have the shared experience of one collective room en masse. I think the question of, is there a human connection when there's just somebody's voice on the phone is really what this project is investigating. I think all of our projects deal with human connection, as you say, by putting people in a room together and having them have the opportunity to look at each other, to share space with one another, to be shoulder to shoulder with one another in the same event. And I think this project asked the question, can there be a human connection when all we have is somebody's voice? Can we still leave space for one another? Can we still hold one another? Can we still do the work together even when we are separated by um, so much? Navigating this new medium was a challenge. Even though this piece is performed by the audience, there's no way for us to sort of read the room. And it feels a little bit like cutting off a tail of an animal, like you don't have this this tool that you've used to navigate the world, which is like being in shared space together and getting a sense of something. Um, You know, you can never totally, completely know what an audience is experiencing, but as a theater artist, part of the work is feeling and sort of getting a sense of something. One of the things we were thinking about throughout the writing and the making of this piece is the insular nature of quarantine, right, is that we all retreat into our homes, we retreat with our roommates or our families, or if we live with people, um, we retreat into what's known, you know, you then speak to your families on the phone, you speak to your friends on Zoom, but you're not having encounters with those who are unfamiliar to you, you're not running into people, you're not having to deal with outsiders, you're not having to navigate how to be a social being in the world. And I think that the piece is about loneliness in a way. And I think it draws a frame around the solitude and the loneliness of this moment in time for us globally in all the myriad of ways that we're experiencing it. And so I suppose 
one of my hopes would be that it reminds, I think in that isolation, we can become myopic and we can become, you can lose sight of who else is out there because you don't have to navigate sharing the world with them. And I just wonder if the piece can delicately nudge a reminder of someone somewhere else that you'll never actually speak to again that has their own complexity and their own complex experience that they are living through. The artwork takes place on the phone. As a member of the audience, you are guided through an encounter with a complete stranger, someone else from the audience. The meeting should lead to a connection with someone you can't see and do not know. Although the idea of this piece had been floating around, Abby thinks the limitations of the last year spurred its development. I think there is something exciting about the reinvention that comes from limitation. That a piece like A Thousand Ways, the phone call is, it requires a complete reinvention of how we're going to address this in production language. Um, Not only who the performers are and how this thing operates, but from a producing end, how does the box office work, right? How does the process go from buying a ticket to to experiencing the thing how do, what does a program look like you know i mean it's a complete reinvention of the form and i think that is really exciting because i think if you do something like this in without the limitation present i think it can be consumed with a kind of distraction about the form is like oh how novel, you know, you don't talk about the heart of the thing. People would just talk about the fact that it's on the phone and now, and it would be sort of like the super radical reinvention of theater. And at the same time, it's like, but this is the only way we can do theater right now. So I think we found that the piece can, that audiences are forced to be more adventuresome, that audiences that might be more drawn or feel more comfortable with something that's, fairly mainstream in form and content. Now we have to be radical. Coronavirus shut down industries with a brutality that reverberated through the art world. Martha Redbone is a native and African-American blues artist. Her band had been touring the U.S. when the pandemic hit. No, no, never can it be, never, never can it be. COVID-19 has pretty much all but destroyed my entire (laughs) work. We had, my band had literally just come off the road. We had a really amazing run of shows. We developed a kind of uh, theatrical concert, musical concert, um, based on my family in the Appalachian Mountains. And we had been on this run of great shows around the country. And we literally, our last show that we had was in um, Berkeley, uh, California, just outside San Francisco. And the night of our concert was the, we had just heard about the first case of the coronavirus um, that was about uh, three hours away in Washington state. And so we got on a plane uh, the next morning and flew back to New York and, and within a week they said, don't go out. And from that point on, all of the rest of our shows from last March through February, you know, through this year, you know, just disappeared, just wiped away just like that. And I don't know about how it is for, for I'm sure it is for other freelancers um, with our band members. That was it. There are no gigs. We're not big rock stars. You know, we're not like Prince or, or you know, Lenny Kravitz or these guys, you know, who are huge stars who can afford to um, pay musicians, uh, keep musicians on retainers. So it has been really devastating for all of us. Can a mother sit in here? An infant grown, an infant feed. The challenges for the art world were vast and varied. Galleries and performance spaces went online, offering unique access to people all over the globe. But Martha felt this brought about conflicting outcomes. Hear the small birds grief and care, hear the woes that infants bear. The one thing that I feel that is a saving grace and through all of it is the fact that we are musicians, that we are artists, and we do this work 
because it's who we are. It's a, it's a part of our daily practice. So, you know, I get to sing every day. We play music every day. We kind of, you know, jam. And of course, now we have things like, um, you know, because of these Zoom things, that's also changed <laughs> because now, you know, musicians, we're kind of being forced by the public to be their entertainment for free. And because we're musicians, and we're healers by by kind of you know what we do for a living. We are in the position where we do provide music and and entertain people and heal people through these challenging times. And uh, it also reminds me of um, the musicians who were on the Titanic. You know, as the ship was sinking, they were they still forced the musicians to remain on the boat until after all the passengers had debunked the the ship as it was going down. And us musicians were still the ones being forced to play music to our depths. So it kind of really reminds me of, of that. Not to be morbid, but that's, that's the kind of truth. <laughs> Martha's music is a mix of blues, jazz, folk, and soul music from America, and has very much been defined by her cultural roots. For music, one of the most important elements is, you know, I feel very blessed that even through this um, crisis, we're able to have something that offers healing, healing for ourselves and for other people. I think, um, you know, music is a healer. It's, it's something that's in all of us and it's in nature, it's in the earth, it's in all the trees and the birds. And I think that, thank goodness that we, we have this around us to offer some kind of healing. I guess there's a, the, the resonance, how it resonates in our bodies and, and the music you know, the styles of music that we all have come from our homelands. The music that I make is, a, you know, comes from my homeland. It's a combination of everything that I am. I'm an Afro-Indigenous woman. I'm African-American and Native American. I'm Southeastern um, tribal. I'm, you know, Cherokee, Shawnee and Choctaw tribes. And I've been, you know, born and raised in the mountains by my grandparents. And so I have this music that um, comes from my grandmother, my grandparents, and their, you know, and my ancestors, you know, before them and before them. And I feel like that is a huge part of the musical influence that that kind of, you know, keeps me going. And, and now that I'm a, a mom myself, um, it's important for me to keep those traditions going. I'm also really uh, fortunate to have been raised also in my teenage years in New York City with my mother. And, you know, so I have the sounds of like the New York City streets and hip hop and rock and, and all of that. So I feel really lucky that I have this kind of um, spread of music from, you know, the mountains to the city. And this combination is what you know, I try and I strive to reflect in, in the music that, that I do. Although Martha's music is grounded in the musical traditions of the U.S., her album, The Garden of Love, Songs of William Blake, is inspired by the English poet from the late 18th century and early 19th century. Martha explains. We started going through some of the poetry and we not only found, you know, one or two, we found loads that we absolutely loved and to me, just told the story of Appalachia. Well, of course, you know, English countryside and, and Appalachia are very similar to each other. A lot of, you know, the mountain people are mountain people all over, you know, the world really very, very much share a, a similar mountain culture around the world. And I also discovered that when we visited China and we worked with the mountain tribe, the Nyosu people. And so I do see that there is a mountain culture of some kind around the world that share a similarity. So um, when we found these beautiful words and, and Blake so just wrote them in a way that I could never, I could never speak English the way that he wrote English. So these melodies just came out. It was very organic and very quick. And when we kind of looked at each other, Aaron and I said, this is really magic. We have to, let's do them all. Let's do, let's do a collection, not just one or two. Let's do a whole collection. And since we're honoring Appalachia, we're honoring Black Mountain, let's honor William Blake. And that's how that came to be. Another artist at the festival is Boom Diwan, a collaborative global jazz ensemble. 
They're inspired by the Kuwaiti pearl diving music of the Indian Ocean trade. Ghazi al Mulefi is the founder of the group. Although the world quickly learned to communicate through online meetings, for musicians working together in different spaces and time zones, this was impossible. As a musician who's uh, involved in traditions that, musical traditions that utilize improvisation as a main part of the interplay, this, this spontaneity was, uh, um, you know, was kind of gone. The, the reason why, I mean, for, for anybody who's not a musician that tries to play music with another musician on Zoom, there are issues with timing where, you know, we call it latency. So basically, uh, if, if you and I started tried to start clapping right now at the same time, it would, it would never happen. And these connections, of course, as a musician, music is the first thing that comes to mind. But also connections with other humans more, more generally, the challenges of finding, you know, kinds of intimacy that I only associated with being physically in the same space as other people. So finding new ways to find uh, real human connections and intimacy was the challenge of 2020. Ghazi found himself drawn to music at a young age. It was many years later he discovered that he was the grandson of a pearl diver and shipmaster. I found out that he was a pearl diver and a shipmaster by, by pure coincidence. I mean, it was never spoken about in my family, which I found also very puzzling. And at the same time, you know, uh, very intriguing. I was very curious by the very fact that this was somebody I was very ex extremely, extremely close with, and uh, and I had no idea about this other life. And when I asked him about it, he just said, "All the men died at sea." You know, he repeated that to me two more times, and I never asked him again because I could tell, you know, that that was a very sad topic, a very traumatic topic. You know, I was 13 when I asked him about this. Uh, so this is, you know, 30, 30 years ago. I still uh, very clearly feel his tone when he says all the men died at sea. And honestly, that was the moment I realized that there was something there that I needed to know more about. And and here we are. Ghazi studied music in New York. And during that time, he visited his home country of Kuwait for a pearl diving trip he learned about from a New York Times article. During this trip, he developed a friendship with Abdulaziz Al-Hameli, a captain of one of the ships. The friendship grew. And a few years later, Ghazi was invited to play with Al-Hameli, a moment that he had been waiting for. That led to the formation of Boom Diwan. Pearl diving bands were never originally meant to be bands. So I come from one of the last three families still practicing pearl diving in Kuwait. And when I say practicing, I mean as an aqua-centric way of life, trading pearls for, for other goods. And so nothing happened on these ships without music. Uh, unless they were praying or sleeping, these pearl divers had um, music to make their life possible and uh, to allow it to go on to make this work possible. Pearl diving bands, I guess the short version of the story is, um, I think people, my grandfather who's passed away, uh, would think it's funny that there's something called a pearl diving band, I think. But basically what happened was after the days of pearl diving was eventually outlawed in Kuwait in the 1950s, a lot of these pearl divers and shipmasters, you know, suffered severe post-traumatic uh, stress. And so they would find these uh, diwaniyas. And the diwaniyas is like a majlis, what we call a majlis here. And that's uh, it's just a room in a home or a standalone hall somewhere. It's a gathering place for family, for politics, for music in our case, uh, for business, whatever it is. So uh, there was a man in 1936, uh, with the last name of Lengawi, who realized that these pearl divers were feeling displaced in their, in their trauma and that there was nowhere for them to express it, no one to, no one who hadn't been lived that kind of life could relate to what that meant. And so he would, uh, he gathered them and said, hey, this is, uh, this is your diwan, and in this diwan here are your, the instruments you used on the uh, pearl diving ship. And mind you, the pearl diving ship instruments were just the tabal bahri, which is a large double-headed uh, cylindrical uh, drum actually imported from India. And tuaisat, also most likely uh, imported from India, which are like thumb cymbals or like hand cymbals. And, uh, and he let them just kind of, uh, you know, through their music, they, they were healing, right? Which is a beautiful metaphor. Uh, it's, it's what made their life possible during pearl diving, and then also what made their life possible after pearl diving or bearable. And so these diwaniyas were closed. They were private spaces, you know, people would, uh, and to this day, and some, sometimes you see people crying and expressing uh, big emotions. It, it happens still. Ghazi explains why the name Boom Diwan is both rooted in history, but also informs the band's ideology. We have many different kinds of sailing ships in, in Kuwait. 
that were used for pearl diving. You know, we have like al-batil, shi'u'i, we have so many different kinds. But the boom is the most important one. And there were two kinds of boom. We call them boom ghos and boom sifar. Boom ghos is the pearl diving boom. And boom sifar is the one that we use to um, trade the pearls for other goods. Like my grandfather's teenager, teenager would go to Calicut and, and, and trade his the pearls for, for other goods and bring them back to Kuwait. And so it served kind of as a metaphor for this... Um, this exploration and and the idea of trade, of exchange, of dialogue. The Diwan is this place where we welcome people and teach them our music and maybe learn their music. It's a place to exchange ideas. So together, I feel like they these two terms uh, kind of embody, you know, the ethos of of this ensemble. The diversity of cultures, styles, and mediums of the artists Bill Briggan brings to NYUAD is a testament to his devotion to find artists pushing boundaries from all corners of the world. The 2020-2021 season showcases artists from South Korea to Venezuela. Themes range from traditional Kuwaiti pearl diving music to the season's launch, Scratch DJ Kid Koala's robot dance party in September 2020, where all the attendees received instructions on how to make their own robot outfits for an online party. Coronavirus affected every industry, and art was especially vulnerable. As the world looked to outlets to watch TV, films, read books, listen to music, and much more, it was obvious that creative content was valuable. Bill Bragan worked, as he always has, to find those on the leading edge of creativity. From a conceptual standpoint, people were going through all kinds of really kind of difficult emotional times, and I think often art is an important way that both the maker and the audience can process those feelings. And at the same time, I think if you can't actually pay artists to perform, commissioning work is actually a really important way to, again, kind of keep investing in, in artists. To learn more about the NYU AD Art Center programming, please visit www.nyuad-artcenter.org. You've been listening to Recorded. I've been your host, Alexander Chavez. Next week, we'll have part three of this series, where we speak to Maya Allison, the executive director and chief curator at the NYU AD Art Gallery. Please subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. And if you want to let us know what you think, we'd love to read your review. This episode was produced by Aisha Khan and Arthur Edison.